12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Bars are open again and restaurants can now serve more people as Texas continues to ease up on restrictions. But how many people will actually show up? That is the question. Garrett Berger checked up on a local campaign that's meant to reassure customers that businesses are trying to stay safe. For weeks, the Riverwalk has been a shadow of its normal self. But as more businesses reopen, the San Antonio Riverwalk Association, or SARA, is trying to make sure visitors know it's okay. We know that there are a lot of people that want to get out of the house and come someplace fun, and we want to assure them that we are safe. In addition to its own Riverwalk Safe campaign, SARA is one of more than 660 businesses and organizations that have signed the Greater Safer Together pledge. The pledge includes seven points like using face coverings, conducting temperature checks, and following CDC cleaning protocols. Thompson says Riverwalk businesses aren't shying away from it. They embrace these. They want the public to feel safe. They want their staff to feel safe. And that's the hope. I think it helps build that confidence um, it, and, and, and that relationship with our businesses, with our neighborhood restaurants and, and all the places that we want to get back to. The economic transition team that came up with this Greater Safer Together campaign was a collaboration between the city and the county. And both are pushing the pledge as they distribute safety supplies and PPE to various businesses and nonprofits. In fact, the city says that's part of the registration process for its distribution event here at the Alamo Dome next week. And it also provides them with collateral material for them to post um, on their at, at their businesses to show patrons that that they are making this pledge as well. But it will be up to customers to decide if the pledge and those precautions are enough. We want them to know when they're ready, we're ready. Gary Berger, KSAT 12 News. An employee with the county County Tax Assessor's Office has tested positive for COVID-19. According to the office, the employee was sent home to be tested after they were overheard saying they had recently traveled out of the country. All other employees who were in close contact with that person have also been tested. None of those results have come back, back positive. The office says despite all precautions being taken, there is simply no way to avoid, quote, bad judgment by an employee who traveled out of the country without quarantining on their return, end quote. Other big stories we are following today. A Texas Supreme Court ruling today means that the case of Cameron Reedus, the University of the Incarnate Word student shot and killed by a campus police officer almost six years ago, is on its way back to court. Reedus was killed during a confrontation with a school police officer in December of 2013. The Reedus family later filed a wrongful death suit against the school and the university countered claiming sovereign immunity. In an eight to one opinion issued today, the court denied the claim. We're excited that the court is going to let us take this back to the trial court and um, so that we can show what happened to Cameron Reedus and that we can get justice for the Reedus family. Perry, Perry said that the case probably will not get to court until next year. We reached out to the university to get a comment on today's ruling, but we did not get a response. Well, day two in the books for the double down in S.A. Town blood drive going on at the Alamo Dome. This morning, San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg was there to give the gift of life, joining other donors who are trying to help the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center shore up the blood, blood supply. Since elective surgery started back up again, officials say they have been sending more blood out than they've been getting. A $10 HEB gift card is given to encourage people to donate. And for every donation, $5 will go to the San Antonio Food Bank. And when we had the original shortage of blood down to two plus days, when the city heard the calls from the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center, we got together and we tripled the supplies that are available. And that was part of what has led to us being in a position where we can now open up our community again. The blood drive runs through tomorrow. If you want to donate, you need an appointment to make one. Call the number on your screen, 210-731-5590, or go to southtexasblood.org. Get a look at your time saver traffic on this Friday, heading into a long holiday weekend, taking a look at I-10 and La Quintera. Not a lot of traffic out there. Most people still at home and uh, not heading out too far, it looks like, for the Memorial Day weekend, at least today. Meanwhile, summer-like weather is here, and already the state has reported at least two dozen child drownings and counting so far this year. Two toddlers in the greater Houston area found yesterday in a pond. One drowned, 
The other at last word remains in critical condition tonight. Yet with more families now having to stay home, Jesse DeGollado tells us if they have swimming pools, those can pose a real risk without taking the necessary precautions. One, two, three, jump! Few children can resist splashing around in a swimming pool on a hot day. Trying to tell them what not to do? Definitely no jumping on top of each other, no grabbing each other, pulling each other under, no horseplay. Isn't a parent's only job poolside, one that's often easier said than done. This is free time for me also, and just wanting to talk to my friends, hang out with my friends, catch up with them. Um, distractions are real. Obviously, the more kids that are in the pool, the easier it is to lose sight of them. Exactly why designating one or two adults to constantly supervise them is urged by Child Protective Services, along with child safety locks on doors, pool alarms when there's a big splash, even safety nets to cover the pool when not in use. The agency also recommends swimming lessons, learning CPR, having a cell phone at the ready for an emergency, plus using floaties and life vests for weaker swimmers. Child Protective Services is promoting pool safety in hopes of preventing drownings that are always investigated for any neglectful supervision. We have to make sure, was somebody watching the pool? Were they under the influence? Was there something that could have been done to prevent the drowning? Many on days like this that were meant for fun and enjoyment. Jesse de Goyado, KSAT 12 News. Well, we now know the name of the man who opened fire at the Naval Station in Corpus Christi before he was shot and killed by security. According to officials, Adam Al-Sahli of Corpus Christi tried to speed through a gate at Naval Station Corpus Christi, then started shooting at security personnel. A sailor was hit, but she managed to roll and hit a switch, and that raised a barrier in front of the shooter's vehicle. Al-Sali was killed in the exchange of gunfire. FBI agents say the shooting appears to be terrorism related. Not even broccoli can throw the Border Patrol off the scent of marijuana smugglers in South Texas. Officers say they found more than 3,000 pounds of pot hidden in a shipment of fresh broccoli at the Far International Bridge cargo facility. That's worth about $600,000 on the street. We are told Border Patrol agents found 378 packages of marijuana hidden amongst the vegetables. Airports throughout the country have been pretty empty since the coronavirus pandemic forced the cancellation of many travel plans. Well, today, San Antonio International Airport officials are announcing they expect to see a huge uptick in airport traffic leading up to Memorial Day and beyond. Devin Clark tells us how many passengers are expected and what new measures have been put in place to keep them safe. Last year on May 22nd, the San Antonio International Airport saw just over 5,300 passengers. Today, exactly one year later amid the pandemic, just under 2,000 are expected to fly. But as the Memorial holiday approaches, airport officials predict the number of travelers will continue to rise. So passenger traffic has definitely picked up. Between today and the day after Memorial Day, the 26th, we expect about 8,000 passengers. Traffic is expected to continue increasing after Memorial Day leading up to the 4th of July. Matthew Bradshaw, who just flew back home from D.C. where he went for work, is already seeing the increase. He says his plane was at 90% capacity. In fact, uh, all the rows next to me were completely all packed up. A huge difference from what South Carolina native Andrew Hudgens says he saw when he came a month ago for work. There was still plenty of room, but I'm hearing a lot of rumors for going back. Airport officials reminding travelers to get to the airport two hours early and check with your airlines for any delays to help keep the process as smooth as possible. In an effort to make traveling safer, officials are having DC covers installed, which ensure that passengers skip a seat to help with social distancing. Eventually, they'll be put at all the waiting areas throughout the airport. When you're checking in at the gate, there's new acrylic barriers between you and the airline representative, so that's helping us practice social distancing. Hand sanitizing stations have been placed at every high traffic area. Denver native Mark Smith appreciates the precautions being taken to prevent the spread of COVID-19. It is a concern, but you know, I still have to travel and life still goes on. At SAT, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. All right, let's take a live look outside with live cam. Everything pretty quiet right now, but the weekend ahead, Adam, it's going to yeah. be busy. Yes, it's, you know, we're getting into an active weather pattern, so there will be periods throughout the holiday weekend where 
will likely have some showers and thunderstorms. Not the entire weekend, you'll still be able to get outside and enjoy yourself, but you just have to be weather aware. And the aquifer is up a little bit today, at three tenths of a foot and seven tenths of a foot below the May average. We could use a little more rain, of course, not just to boost the aquifer to put another dent in our drought. Unfortunately, mold pollen, mollen, mold pollen, still it's high again today with a count of 1,000. Today we topped out at 96 after a morning low of 77 and temperatures should be on the downswing a little bit as we get into the weekend. A little extra cloud cover and those enhanced uh, storm chances should take care of that. Right now we're mostly in the low to mid 90s this evening. Nothing to worry about. Mostly clear out there right now. Some storms in Mexico, but we're not really worried about those coming together. Otherwise, just humid, then becoming mostly cloudy overnight. And we'll start Saturday with low clouds. Then notice how we have those storm chances peppered throughout the holiday weekend. I'm going to talk about that in more detail coming right up. Memorial Day weekend is here and over here at Canyon Lake, people are already out ready to get some fun in the sun for the holiday. But tonight, the guidelines they should remember. Well, we made it through another week. It is Friday and uh, city and county uh, briefing is about to take place here shortly. Let's listen in. We're joined by Jennifer Harriet, who is an assistant director at Metro Health, overseeing our walk up testing facilities as well as our COVID-19 hotline. And this is our update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we have 2,392 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Bear County. That's an increase yesterday, uh, increase from yesterday of 21 cases. 13 of those are from the community. We have no new, no new cases from the jail. We do have one in congregate settings and there are seven pending investigation. Sadly, we do have two new deaths to report tonight, bringing the total since the crisis began to 66. One was a white female between the ages of 80 and 89, uh, who was a former resident of the advanced rehab facility. And another was a black male, 70 to 79 years of age, who was a resident of the Pecan Valley nursing home. So both of those were associated with our congregate facilities. And as you know, we've been doing universal testing in those facilities uh, as of late. We do have 73 COVID positive patients in local hospitals tonight. That's down nine from yesterday. 17 more people are in the hospital under investigation, meaning they're waiting test results for a total of 90 people hospitalized related to the virus. 41 uh, of them are on intensive care and 21 on ventilators. So we still have strong capacity in our hospitals. Uh, I do want to make note of hospital data, though. A caller on our hotline today named Don noted that hospitalizations have gone up steadily over the past few weeks and asked us to address that tonight. So the screen, uh, the, the graphic that you see on the screen shows the number of COVID positive patients in area hospitals since the outbreak began. He is correct that since hospitalizations dropped below 60 individuals in April, they have gradually grown to 82 today before, excuse me, 82 yesterday before dropping to 73 today. There's a couple of takeaways from this. First, the increases in the number of hospitalizations cannot be attributed to increased testing. These are not asymptomatic cases because they're in the hospital. They are sick. Uh, these are individuals who are sick enough to warrant going to the hospital and they require intensive care. So while the increase is gradual and it's not a spike, it is a cause for concern. So we were watching that data closely. The second uh, takeaway from this is that it reminds us all that the virus is still out there. It hasn't gone away. And as the state of Texas reopens, we need to keep that in mind. We are going to see more people contracting the virus, and unfortunately, that means some getting sick and possibly even dying. This is why it's absolutely critical that we continue to follow the guidelines and recommendations of our public health professionals, including our physical distancing and the wearing of masks if you're within proximity of someone who's not in the household. This is very serious. It's important to continue to mind the public health recommendations if we want to continue to open our economy, we've got to do so carefully and in, in, in uh, recognition that this virus is out there and we want to protect each other's health and safety. Lastly, I'll say that not one indicator triggers an alarm. We have to watch all of the progress and warning indicators. You can do so on our website, covid19.sanantonio.gov. Taken all together gives us an indication whether or not we're going forward or, or going backwards in terms of the progress of containing this virus. We want to 
continue to do our steady march forward, so continue to listen to the public health professionals. Judge Wolf? Yeah, thank, th thank you, Mayor. Uh, let me first of all thank Suzanne Scott with the San Antonio River Authority. Sent me a new bandana. Uh, speaking on what the uh, mayor was talking about with respect to the um, covering of your face, uh, there's been some research that's been done at the University of Hong Kong by Dr. Kwa Young. He was a leading microbiologist who helped discover the SARS virus in 2000. Uh, so he, he knows what he's talking about. Their research shows that the, ship, the scarf can save up to 75% of the spread of the virus. So very important that, that, that you do that. Uh, well, Tracy and I, well, Tracy mostly decided to help the economy today. Uh, she bought four share, chairs at uh, Lewis Shanks today, and we had a nice steak at Saltgrass, first one I've had in about three months. Uh, everybody's doing the right thing. Um, we got a letter back from the governor with respect to the fact that 11 uh, county judges are the largest areas of Texas, taking 69 percent of all the uh, COVID cases and, and getting allocated only 28 uh, percent. He gave no reason to do that other than the fact he wants to be fair to Texas and give everybody the same allocation whether they got the, uh, a problem with COVID or not. So it's not a very good answer and not a very good reason. Uh, things are going to change, as we know. A uh, big announcement today from Facebook by Mark Zuckerberg uh, that within the next 10 years, over 45,000 employees working for Facebook will be working at home. So you're seeing that happen across the uh, United States, and this is probably one of the biggest ones, but uh, that's going to be becoming a fact of life, and that's certainly what we're doing at Bear County. Okay. Thank you, Judge. And as always, you can get the latest on COVID-19 in our community by going to the website covid19.sanantonio.gov. You can also text COSAGOV to 55000 and keep up the great work. We are going into a holiday weekend, but do not let your guard down. We want to continue to protect the health and safety of our neighbors, our loved ones, and ultimately our economy. So do what you can. Continue to uh, continue to mind the public health guidance, and we will all be better for it. So at this point, we have uh, Jennifer Harriet, uh, the judge and myself. Here all right, we've been listening into uh, the daily city county briefing, and first, let's go over some of the uh, latest numbers. 2,392 confirmed cases and uh, two new deaths from nursing homes, bringing the new total to 66. Um, something interesting that the uh, mayor talked about was um, that hospitalizations, that this was a cause for concern, he said hospitalizations have gone up steadily since this all started and uh, talked about a couple, couple of takeaways pertaining to that. Yeah, he said that, you know, that Obviously, that means that the virus is still out and active in the community, so we need to continue to do the social distancing and wearing of the masks. Um, but it also said that it's not affiliated with more testing out there. Mm -hmm. It's just those people are not asymptomatic. Obviously, they have it. They're in the hospital. So people are still getting sick with this, and we need to continue to be safe about all. Of yeah, and certainly even though those hospitalizations have gone up, we still have strong capacity in all of our hospitals, and that this is just one of many indicators that they look at when they um, are, um, you know, deciding how, how to move forward with this, uh, trigger the alarm is the, the, right. the statement that he said. But um, uh, again, the numbers 22,392 confirmed cases and the judge, of course, citing that research from Hong Kong that wearing the mask, wearing that face covering um, saves up to 75 percent of the virus from spreading. And those two new deaths uh, were from nursing home facilities, a uh, white female age 80 to 89 and a black male at another facility between the age of 70 and 79, bringing our total to 66 deaths throughout all of this. All right, turning now to weather, Adam, 94 degrees out there right now. Yeah, 94 degrees, hazy, hot, humid again today. Temperatures will take a little bit of a dive as we get on into the upcoming weekend, but not a steep drop. All right, let's take a look at the radar. Nothing locally right now. And actually, we have mostly clear skies, just some patchy fair weather cumulus clouds. You go into Mexico, so we have those typical afternoon, early evening storms flaring up. We'll get some of the blow off high clouds from those later on, but that's about it. I'm not expecting them to come together, organize and move our way. Main storm threat, and especially severe threat, North Texas, just west of Dallas. It's an active weather pattern right now. We have these upper level lows just lined up. Now they're not directly over us, but they don't need to be. This one on the west coast, that's gonna drop southward, dig a little bit and throw some impulses our way and some upper energy our way through the weekend. 
periodically that's going to enhance our storm chances. So here's a look at our future cast and I like what it does tonight. It has the activity falling apart before it makes it to San Antonio coming in from North Texas. That's the most likely scenario. Maybe a rogue shower to tonight early tomorrow morning. And then as we get into Saturday evening and Saturday night, that's when our storm chances start to creep upward and they're they're heightened at that point. Probably some storms coming together out west, pushing eastward. There is the chance of some severe storms and even flash flooding. So here's the main takeaway here as we go through the weekend. During the daylight hours, storm chances only about 20 to 30 percent. Get outside, get the outdoor activities in, go for it. Just be weather aware because when we get to the evening and nights, that's when our storm chances jump up to about the 60 percentile. All right, temperatures dropping back down to the mid 80s by Sunday and Monday. And again, it's the evening and nighttime hours that pose the greatest risk and threat for thunderstorms. All right, thank you, Adam. Sports is next. Spurs great David Robinson was the world's tallest pizza delivery person today. He made a lunchtime stop at the Yadi L. Murphy Memorial Veterans Hospital to help hand out 100 pizzas to frontline health care workers. David's Admiral One Capital Group teamed up with Pizza vs. Pandemic to deliver the pies, and he signed each box as just one way to say thank you. It's been a hard time for everybody, and if we can provide just a, a little encouragement to folks and in a very tough time, we don't know when this is going to be over. We don't know how long you got to you got to pay rent. We don't know long how long you know we've got to put ourselves at risk or how long we got to wear these masks. So everything we can do to encourage folks who are doing all the hard work, I think is really critical at this time. So Admiral Capital has been doing pizza parties everywhere. It's kind of a, a small statement of how much we appreciate everyone. NBA teams are expecting the league office to issue player return guidelines around June 1st, a key step forward to resuming the season, and 5-0 is excited. I think at this time our country really needs some things that will bring us together, and sports is, um, is a, is a much-needed kind of escape right now. So I'm glad that there's a lot of sports trying to figure it out, and as long as we can keep people safe and um, you know, provide that good quality entertainment. You know, I, I think it's good for all of us. In sad news, the NBA lost a great today. Longtime Utah Jazz head coach Jerry Sloan passed away at the age of 78. The Jazz announced that Sloan died from complications from Parkinson's disease and Louis body dementia, which he had revealed diagnosis for in April 2016. Sloan was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame in 2009 after a 26-year head coaching career, 23 of them with the Jazz. He was the fourth overall pick in the 1965 NBA draft and had a successful, a successful 11-year NBA career. Now, here's what Spurs head coach Greg Popovich said in a statement released by the Spurs, quote, it's a sad day for all of us who knew Jerry Sloan, not only on the basketball court, but more importantly, as a human being, he was genuine and true, and that is rare. He was a mentor for me from afar until I got to know him. A man who suffered no fools, he possessed a humor often disguised and had a heart as big as the prairie, end quote. In high school news, the University Interscholastic League released its guidelines for the beginning of summer and strength and conditioning workouts, which is set for June 8th. The list is very long and includes such things as the workouts are voluntary and are not required for each school to do. Currently, a strength and conditioning session cannot be more than two consecutive hours per day, Monday through Friday. Indoor workouts will be allowed while maintaining a 25% capacity with workout stations set 10 feet apart on all sides and all equipment thoroughly disinfected after each use. The locker rooms and showers will remain closed and athletes will have to show up dressed and ready. There is no shared water. The kids will need to bring their own water bottles and it's individual drills only. No seven on seven or drills against a defender. So what happens if a student or staff member tests positive for COVID-19? The UIL says, quote, if a positive case is identified among the participant in these summer activities, either staff or student, the group to which that staff or student was assigned and in contact with must be removed from the sessions while all members of the group self isolate. If the confirmed individual individual regularly had close contact outside a single group, then all of the students and staff with whom the confirmed individual had close contact shall be removed from workouts for two weeks." End quote. A lot to be worked out yet. A lot indeed, yes. Thanks, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back.
This morning, new questions about the unproven drug. President Donald Trump says he's been taking along with zinc to prevent COVID-19. A new study finds hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine are linked to a higher risk of serious illness and even death in COVID-19 patients. As ABC's Inez de la Cotera reports, during an impromptu press conference, the president was not taking questions about the drug. President Trump speaking to reporters on reopening houses of worship, but taking no questions. I call upon governors to allow our churches and places of worship to open right now. If he had, the president would have been asked about a new study in the medical journal The Lancet, where they reviewed nearly 15,000 people given the drugs hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. And regardless of whether the antibiotic azithromycin is added, the coronavirus patients receiving the treatments were found to be at a much higher risk of death. The study also finding those taking the anti-malaria drugs to treat COVID-19 face a significantly higher risk of developing a type of irregular heart rhythm that can lead to sudden heart failure. The research was based on a retrospective analysis of existing cases, not a controlled randomized study. It's one of our clearest study because there were so many thousands, tens of thousands of individuals involved. Trump has repeatedly touted hydroxychloroquine, even claiming he's been taking it along with zinc after consulting his White House physician. I've taken it, I think, just about two weeks. I think it's another day. So. And I'm still here. Meanwhile, news today that the Department of Veterans Affairs has administered hydroxychloroquine to 1,300 veterans who tested positive for coronavirus. That's about 13 percent of the total number of veterans currently being treated for COVID-19 at VA medical facilities. Why the heck is the Veterans Administration using our veterans who are so important, who have risked their lives for us in a test that could be really harmful to them? The World Health Organization now reiterating its warning against using the drug as a treatment for COVID-19. The current cl clinical evidence does not support the widespread use of uh, hydroxychloroquine for the treatment of uh, COVID-19. And with all 50 states now reopening, experts are warning of a possible second wave. CDC Director Dr. Robert Redfield not ruling out a second lockdown. But President Trump says he doesn't want the nation to close again. In de la Quatera, ABC News, Washington. If you're having one, your Memorial Day cookout could be costing you a little bit more this year, even the hot dogs and burgers. Grocery prices have been going up across the board because of disruptions to the supply chain and higher demand. More people are eating at home as well. Another factor, major meat processing plants slowed down or shut down because of workers getting sick. Some other food prices are higher as well. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the cost of carbonated drinks were up 4.5% and snacks were about 4% higher in April. Some people confuse Memorial Day with Veterans Day, but USAA says it is determined to educate the public on the significance of Memorial Day. This year, the company is honoring fallen heroes virtually. Sarah Costa spoke with the USAA official about how it's adapted during this pandemic to continue its tradition. A poppy worn is a hero honored. It's the universal symbol of remembering those that have died defending our country. But why the poppy? Uh, back in World War I, a Canadian Army doctor buried his friend in Flanders Field during the war and wrote a poem. Retired U.S. Navy Vice Admiral and now USAA Senior Vice President John Byrd explains that in the poem, the author wrote about how the poppies blow among the many rows of crosses. Because of that poem, he says it's known in many countries as a symbol of remembrance. It's through those poppies that USAA has honored fallen heroes on Memorial Day for the past two years through a temporary poppy wall of honor installation on the National Mall near the Korean Way. The wall is filled with 645,000 artificial poppies, one for each life lost in the line of duty since World War I. But because of the coronavirus pandemic, that event will be virtual this year. So we have a website poppyandmemory.com. They can visit, learn about the poppy, the poppy wall, the men and women, the history of these conflicts. Admiral Byrd says the virtual event encourages online visitors to remember our fallen heroes through social media posts. He says he hopes the virtual poppy wall will continue to educate the public on the importance of honoring those that make the ultimate sacrifice. We as a country need to show how much we respect that 
and how much we value those that give up their lives for us. So it goes to our national character, and it's critically important that we take yet but one day a year to remember those fallen. Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. Instead of shutting down a popular city park, San Francisco officials are trying something else first. How this design is meant to keep people safe. Coming up next. But first, news around America tonight. An old Air Force in New Mexico, uh, Air Force Base in New Mexico, has become the parking place for hundreds of airplanes that are no longer flying due to the outbreak. Everything from small planes to wide body seven, uh, 777s can uh, be found at what used to be Walker Air Force near Roswell. Uh, officials say the large runway and dry climate make it the perfect place to park the planes until the beleaguered airline business can fly again. But not all these aircraft are destined to fly again. Some of them, officials say, will be retired and their parts recycled. City officials in San Francisco making sure people keep their distance at one park. People visiting the Dolores Park getting their first look at this new design Thursday. Human parking spots. These circles are supposed to help groups who are not in the same household keep six feet apart. The mayor threatened to shut down the park earlier this month after crowds failed to maintain social distancing. This new look just in time for Memorial Day weekend. Human parking spots. That's yeah. what it's come to. Interesting. Taking a live look outside with city cam. Lots of heat, humidity and haze out there and some interesting weather headed our way. Yeah, you really want to just park yourself in a pool, don't you? Yes. Yes, exactly. I know. Not With all. a margarita. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Even better. Uh huh. And, you know, I know not all pools are open and stuff right now. We'll do what we can to stay cool through the weekend. It's still going to be warm and humid. We're 96 for the high temperature today. And across the state, we were mostly well into the 90s for those afternoon readings. They will get trimmed back a little bit into the weekend, but mostly it's an active weather pattern that's going to bring us daily storm chances. I'll break it all down for you because it's going to be basically periodic throughout the weekend. I'll see you in a couple minutes to talk about it. There has been a lot of buzz about the so-called skinny gene, the mystical reason why some people can eat whatever they want and don't seem to gain any weight. Well, it turns out there may be something behind that. Researchers say a gene may actually be helping them stay oh, I sleep. Totally it's been a while since we've done the buzz. Yes. <laughs> An international scientific team found a genetic variant that's unique to thin individuals. The researchers say the ALK gene, which creates a protein that's involved with cell growth, could lead to a new era in the fight against obesity. The findings published in the journal Cell were based on clinical data on a clinical data study on nearly 48,000 people who were between the ages of 20 and 44 years old. Okay, this is going to hit some of you harder than others. Pac-Man is 40 years old today. Do you feel old? <laughs> the Maze video game first showed up in a Tokyo arcade back on May 22nd, 1980. Now get this, it was originally called, I'm going to say it carefully and slowly, yeah. Puck man with a P, but the game's American distributor feared kids would change the P to an F on the marquee and now you see why I went yeah. slowly. Yes, <laughs> the change was made and Pac-Man was born. It was a game changer for video games with a defined main character and the first power up. The game looks very simple, but it's much harder than it looks. Yeah. To this day, only a handful of people have completed a perfect game, finishing with no lives lost and the maximum number of points from each level. Still get anxiety when yes. those uh, ghosts are chasing you there. Lost many a quarters on that I, game. I had a lot yeah. of anxiety just doing that read. Yeah. For a lot of people, the uh, holiday weekend is about barbecue and beer, but some connoisseurs are arguing for a more spirited edition. Today is National Craft Distillery Day, which is fairly new, just uh, the second one ever. The National Day calendar says May 22nd is time to honor the small batch revolution. Distilling gin, rum, and other spirits dates back to ancient Greece. Fast forward to the 1990s and craft breweries surged in popularity. Soon after, local liquor artisans jumped on the trend. N. Scott Distillery founded National Craft Distillery Day last year, which is the day it started crafting small batches. I've got some relatives in the hills of Kentucky and 
West Virginia that uh, were doing yeah. some distilling of their own. Uh, <laughs> that's a different type yeah, of distilling there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's. Uh, I don't know if that falls under the, this type of craft distilling. Day. Yeah, it's a different not. craft. <laughs> <laughs> definitely a craft, right? Yes. It yeah. definitely is. But uh, I used to live in uh, Northern Virginia, and I knew some folks down in Southern Virginia, Danville area. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> it was interesting. All right. Let's talk about our weather headlines. Active weekend ahead with uh, our weather pattern throwing some impulses of energy at us. And that I do think will kickstart some storms scattered in nature periodically throughout the weekend. It's not going to be all weekend long. There will be some sunshine. So sun and storms basically is the main headline and focus for the weekend. And the primary threat will be in the evenings and night times. So I do think you'll be able to get outside and get in the outdoor activities. All right, looking at the radar at the moment, really not a lot of activity. It's all in Mexico and right along the Rio Grande uh, outside of Valverde County. This activity is unlikely to come together and organize and move our way. What we have to do is watch basically along the I-20 corridor for more development overnight tonight, some of which could be severe up to the north just west of Dallas, as that has the chance to organize and drop southward. It's a slim chance but maybe we could cash in on a stray shower left over from that late tonight. All right, look at this active weather pattern. No big blue H. Uh-uh. The heat high not parked right overhead. We don't have a big upper level high. We've got multiple disturbances in our upper atmosphere. And this one right here over northern Nevada, that's going to drop southward and start throwing some energy our way. And that's what's likely to kickstart and trigger some showers and thunderstorms over parts of the upcoming weekend. Here's one future cast that we've liked lately. It's been handling the situations pretty well, but it shows the activity from North Texas dropping southward and falling apart before it makes it here. Sure, maybe a rogue shower or two tomorrow morning. Generally just cloudy in the morning, sunny in the afternoon, warm and humid. But then notice even as we get into tomorrow evening and afternoon, the showers start to develop in Mexico, West Texas as well. That activity should organize and come together and start moving eastward. And that's the primary threat will be in the evening hours tomorrow and even tomorrow night into Sunday morning. And the evening and overnights are the primary time periods of those storm threats. So look at the weekend this way. During the daylight hours, 20 to 30 percent chance. During the evening and overnight hours, well, about a 60% chance, so a little more widespread coverage. And as for rainfall potential, with this pattern lasting into next week, I mean, we could be counting rainfall the inches on two hands in some parts of Texas, okay? It's impossible to pinpoint who's going to get the most rain. It's all situational and will depend on where those storms exactly flare up and who gets multiple storms. But we could have some flash flooding and we could have some severe weather, so we'll keep you updated. Dew points. In the 60s, we're feeling that mugginess, and that just adds to the uh, fuel for thunderstorms. Temperatures dropping down into the 80s for highs over the upcoming weekend. And again, this active pattern lasts all the way into next week. I like how you broke out the day to night rain yeah. chances. I'm glad you like that. That's helpful. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. The search is over for the driver of a big rig who took off from the scene of a fatal wreck this morning along I-10 and Dominion Road. 29-year-old Justin Antoine Jackson has been arrested for his involvement in that crash. Right now, the Bear County Medical Examiner is working to identify the 46-year-old woman who was killed. San Antonio police found that 18-wheeler about 20 miles away from the crash site on Crockett and Bowie Streets downtown. Within hours, police determined it was Jackson who rear-ended the woman's compact Ford around 5.30 this morning. She died at the scene. The truck was found with some of the wreckage still attached to it. Jackson is charged with failure to stop and render aid. Dozens of people had to evacuate a hotel after an electrical short happened after 10 last night at the Sabred Suites on Northeast Loop 410. Fire investigators say a multi-plug in the basement shorted out, causing the fire alarm to go off. Everyone was allowed to go back inside after firefighters cleared some smoke. Governor Greg Abbott releasing a public service announcement today encouraging Texans to continue to social distance and wear face coverings as the state reopens. If you go out in public, stay six feet apart from others. Wear a face covering and wash your hands regularly. Be a good neighbor. Be a Texan. And they're off.
fun time at a senior living community. This is in Baltimore, home of the Preakness. And since the actual running of the 145th Preakness has been postponed to the coronavirus, the staff at the center decided they would stage their own race. It was a chance to get the residents outside and breathe a little fresh air at the same time, practice some social distancing. They also had some entertainment. A band showed up. It was some fun all the way around. So the biggest takeaway for this upcoming Memorial Day holiday weekend during the daylight hours, some sunshine and just a few isolated 20 to 30 percent chances of storms. Then we get into the evening and nighttime hours and that's when our chances are heightened and we should have some scattered activity and the potential for some heavy downpours. And this active weather pattern is going to last into next week. We could easily see five, six inches of rain in some parts of South Texas through next Wednesday. Thank you, Adam, and thanks for watching the News at 6. Be back here for the Night Beat tonight at 10, and don't forget the 9 wherever you stream.